All right, Tim, here we are, the culminating episode of season five. We're kind of bringing everything together now and diving into a program review. So just go ahead and dive on in, take it away. So as we're going down to this kind of rabbit hole of how we evaluate programs, I do think there's a context around we need to have something say something's good or bad. And, you know, don't tell me I know a good program when I see it because I know what it looks like. That's not good enough. We have to have objectivity. We have to have consistency. And I have the great fortune of being able to evaluate programs every day. And I think about that because it not only represents, you know, my gym, but also me and my brand and what I associate with value. And I have a platform where I talk about programming decisions. I talk about being very person-centric or problem -cent outcome-centric, not necessarily solution-centric. And if I don't have consistency with that, I'm going to be just like everyone else ruled by subjectivity or bias or agenda. And when I want to really look at all of these episodes we've done going from problem solving, goal setting to training splits, exercise selection, micro variable selection, microcycle organization, mesocycle organization, macro cycle, and then advanced periodization is to now go, let's wrap this up. So we can have some sort of quick and decisive way to say, this is going to be effective towards the problem we're trying to solve based off of our constraints in our weight room. And then the other part, it's this, all right, let's be honest about this. Let's make sure that we always doing our due diligence to put out the best version of ourselves every single time. And if I'm going to write a blog, if I'm going to write a, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to have people proof it. And I think the same thing with our programming, that is your art, that's your representation of all your knowledge and all your skill. And then the folks that kind of downplay the significance of writing a program, because it's going to be subject to change. I don't think really understand that due diligence and the holy grail is writing a program that never has to change because that means you did everything you possibly could do to effectively help and serve that client or athlete, knowing that every day you're going to be facing with an insurmountable amount of change and evolution of a person that, that as we start to break this down, you know, having the contingency in place to make sure that we know when and how to change, not just arbitrarily changing. All right. So let's break this down here. So. We're gonna have three sections here. We got section one is the premise. You know, what problem we're trying to what problem we're trying to solve, what solutions we need to do, and what feedback loops do we need to create based off of that? Because one thing I will find in this essential part is when people start to focus on solutions before the problem, we run into some issues and we are forcing square peg round hole a lot, or we're thinking hammer and nail, and there's more things in the world than just hammer and nails. Section two is the plan. How are we applying principles? How are we creating rules? And then what feedback loops do we need to create off of that? And then we'll go through this section three, this evaluation by compiling as well as grading, right? And we'll talk about that more in depth, but you're thinking this hopefully is efficient, quick, especially in these like athletic departments that have 40 something teams, thousand athletes, or you're in a situation where you have 40 to 50 clients on your roster and you need to make sure that you're holding yourself accountable, whether it's yourself or you're having a third party come in there and help you. All right. So let's go through the premise. What is the problem? What problem are we trying to solve? And you think about this from, okay, I have a person in front of me that's entrusting me with some sort of issue they're dealing with. For the gen pop, it's losing weight or gaining muscle. Those are usually the areas that they're going to solicit a personal trainer or a strength conditioning coach. And you're thinking in your mind, okay, I am either a, the, this person is very niched out. Like I only focus on those, that particular thing. And then I might have a Contrary thing, right? Someone came to me and want to work on powerlifting for me. I would have to tell them maybe there's other better, there's better people for them, because I might have the equipment, I might have the skill, I might have the knowledge. Conversely, I might be the weight loss specialist and a powerlifting person comes up to me and I go, okay, like I don't focus on this. I think I can do a really good job. I'm open minded in terms of how I'm going to address your underlying issues. I could put together a comprehensive program for you. And hopefully you're not just kind of piecemealing it together. Well, that's the central thesis of all good programs is you start with the problem. And when you look at that thing that you put to paper and you, you start to evaluate that, you should be asking yourself, what problem is this trying to solve? And if it's weight loss, it should be dense. It should have more work to re relatively speaking to rest. If we look at it from trying to increase strength or power or speed, it should be intense. It should have a lot more focus on a high intense outburst or out outputs. And then rest should be correspondingly higher or longer. And if it doesn't have that simple surface level, high intensity or high volume or density, you probably start to wonder, well, what is the real solution here? And then there's always context, right? So someone could come up with this, hey, I want to work on strength reserve, which is going to be this improving some quality, whether it's power, relative strength, 
hypertrophy, muscular endurance, and seeking that how it parlays over into other aspects. But I need that explanation because if you're telling me you want to prove this person's body comp and all you're doing is heavy compound multi-joint movements done to, for three to five reps, I'm probably going to go, okay, well, where's this leading? Is there a follow-up off of this? You're trying to increase reserve to have better performance during a maybe more hypertrophy or muscular endurance-based block? How are we going to progress that? So I want to start there because I think that's so foundational. Next is the solution. How are we going to solve the problem? And as we talked about in our training split, we talked about in our microcycle organization, as we talked about with our exercise selection, as we talked about with our variable selection, the thing that's so apparent is when we start to lay in exercises, and then sets, reps, time and retention per rep, intensity and rest, it should have some sort of correspondence and connection to the problem we're trying to solve. And one thing that I think is so evident when we start to lay down our solution is this preconceived notion of what you're already good at. This is where your bias and agenda will come out most. And that's okay. That's completely fine. That's natural. I've said it before. Show me your weight room. I can tell you your philosophy. And that's for a reason, is as we start to think about how we're going to best put a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs would say, how are we going to help people at the highest level? We have to be better than the person directly in front of us. And chances are probably better than our competition. And that usually comes down to a narrowed focus on how we're going to best serve and, and create problems. But you also have to be aware of the limitations of that. And that gets into this next slide. It's what are the bottlenecks? If we look at the bottlenecks for every decision we make from a program or philosophy or a facility, or even the coaches that we hire and, and work with, there's always going to be some sort of inherent ceiling that we have to start to manage. And we look at that and say, all right, well, what is a facility? How much space do you have, right? Can I do running sprint work, plyometrics, if I have limited space? Can I do weightlifting, snatch, clean, and jerk, if I have very tight racks? What's the flow? Right? Do I have people walking in the middle of speed and agility quickness sessions, or do I have segmented out areas? Do I have rack-based? Do I have this more assembly line-based? And then what's the schedule? Right? Do I have a group coming in every 30 minutes? Do I have people kind of like all sporadically coming in these massive limited windows of time between 6 and 8 a.m. or, six and, or six, 5 and 7 p.m. or after school, like a 3 to 5 p.m.? And then how am I going to manage that number of people with a certain program I have? And remember that your chances are you probably already selected what exercises you're going to be doing based off of the facility that you have, but there's going to be some sort of inherent trade-off when you start to align your facility off of that. You just need to be aware of that. And we have to go through maybe a certain simple thing. If I can't do it, it shouldn't be in there. It's probably not worth talking about if you can't do it. Then we talk about equipment, the actual existence and the availability, right? If we go to a box gym on Monday at 6 p.m., chances are your pec or your chest workout is going to be compromised. And that's an extreme example. But now we look at it, why we have 40 racks in college, college weight rooms. Why do we have so much high utility equipment? But with that being said, is the lack there of specific focus if someone needs it, right? Someone to return to play, someone who needs to directly develop a certain muscle group, someone needs to do something very specific, then you're going to have some sort of trade-off with high utility pieces. Or you might look at it from, I got a person that really needs these high specific pieces. I don't have it. And I could put together a piece meld, maybe lower quality version of that. Like for instance, a, instead of doing a leg extension, we do a band TKE, a terminal knee extension. I would argue that, yeah, that's, that's trying to close the gap, but it's nowhere near a level of tension you could create in a seated leg extension, because that's the whole point of that. And saying a band TKE, whether it's with the highest degree of focus on a high tension band is maybe the, the workaround, or maybe you need to sit there and say, like, I probably limited in terms of my ability to serve in this particular case. And then the coach, right? Do they have the ability? Can they actually coach it, right? Do they know how to coach speed, Olympic lifts? And that has a big determinant on the ability to actually do that. The knowledge, do they know what it is actually doing and why they're doing it? And then motivation. I see this all the time, but I see coaches who lack the prerequisite motivation to do the program in front of them. And that has a huge impact on the person in front of them's willingness and desire to actually do it because you're always as good as what you emphasize. And if you can't emphasize it from a lack of motivation, you're probably not going to get the best results. So let's go through this next level. It's if the bottleneck is there, you have to go back to the solution. So if you look at these bottlenecks, facility, equipment, and coach, 
And we start to think, okay, I don't have a piece of equipment or I don't have the right facility or I don't have the right coach. You have to go back all the way to the solution. The problem can't change. The problem is fixed, etch that thing in stone. But if a solution is not congruent with the bottlenecks that are existent, you're always gonna run into some sort of blockage in terms of the, pro the results or the effort you need to take to get those results. And if you don't address this now from a simple existence or the ability to do it, man, like you're gonna constantly run back and do this issue. And if, if we're sitting here saying like, hey, this is a grade, this is getting some sort of points for writing your name correctly on the SATs, sure. But I see a lot of names spelt incorrectly. I really do. And this is the part that I go, okay, like let's not waste each other's time. We don't have that piece. We can't do that. It doesn't work within our facility. Go back to, gr to ground zero and go back to the problem that we're trying to solve and what actually solutions that we have available to us. And this is what it looks like. We're going to stay on the left side here, right? That problem, solution, coach, facility, and equipment. Tim, it seems like a good point for me to step in here. Could you potentially, so you mentioned starting with the problem, could you dive into some specific examples of a potential problem and then the solutions that you come up with based on those bottlenecks or those filters of coaching facility and equipment? Yes. So one thing about the problem that I think is so evident is this idea that it probably falls into these buckets or these avatars, right? We look at most people in gen pot want to do one of two things. They want to lose fat or build muscle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's expressed through I want to gain weight or lose weight, right? That's usually the way that's articulated and you further unpack it. So those are, okay, those are two avatars I can create. I can create a weight loss, weight gain, or I can create a fat loss, muscle gain, right? Like I create those avatars, whatever feels more congruent with the way I want to address that, right? It could be more proactive to say, we're going to build muscle and burn fat, that kind of thing. There's those <laughs> avatars. And then we look at it from the team setting, right? So if I work with a sport like football, there's athletes who need to get faster. There's athletes who need to get stronger. There's athletes who need to gain weight, gain, lose weight. And we start to look at those buckets, start to get filled. And we start to say, okay, like from a, from a, a, just a pure strategy and efficiency standpoint, it's, it's important to have nuance for that individual because that is a principle, but more important right now in this first phase of what problems are we generally solving, right? It's like looking at injury patterns, right? We look at the hot zones for football, ankle, knee, hip, back, shoulder, right? Those are the hot zones for football. And if we could figure out a way to do either more of a prehabilitated program or have a faster rehabilitated program, or just being more conscious of that. And if I could limit that in some way, shape, or form, I should at least do that. And putting these guys into buckets or categories or avatars helps in terms of organizing your solutions. Because if I'm constantly met with weight loss problems and I don't have the tools to accommodate people that want to lose weight or the ability or the motivation, like then I'm going to struggle to actually be actually a good solution for that. And then we start to look at the solution, right? It goes into this varying varying volume or intensity, right? So if I want to gain weight or lose weight, I need to be conscious of that ratio. And if I want to gain weight, I need to be more tension, higher intensity, a little bit less, a little bit more rest. If I want to lose weight, it's going to be a longer duration, a little bit less rest. It's that simple. And then I start to look at the next level. of that. So if I want to build muscle and I don't have maybe targeted stressful, air, stressful things like machines that I could pro provide external load to a muscle group efficiently and safely towards a sort of volitional failure, then I'm going to struggle to utilize compound multi-joint movements in a way that I think is most congruent with building muscle as quickly as humanly possible. But the same thing about, about weight loss or fat loss, a lot of that's predicated off of going longer durations without breaking down technically or biomechanically and leading to injury. And if I can have stationary pieces of cardiovascular equipment or pieces of equipment that facilitate longer duration without breakdown, then I'm going to be able to provide a higher quality level of training to that person. But then you get into the coach. I mean, like how many coaches do you see in gen pop, high intensity training that don't care about what they're doing? Right. You know, you just see it everywhere. I'm a strength conditioning coach. I don't like doing this. I don't connect with this. Motivation is out there. Or maybe I don't have the ability to, the, to push people to the point of discomfort and then get them to push through that. Or maybe I don't have the knowledge of what's going on in lipolysis or mTOR pathways. And you could sit there and say, maybe that's kind of excessive level information, but if it's a central premise as to what you're doing, then you're going to struggle to actually provide those solutions. And the same thing in the athletic world. You see this all the time. I don't have enough space to run, so I can't run. So, but we'll make them faster, getting them stronger to a degree. If the weakness is a limiting factor of strength, sure. You will absolutely do that. But if it's not the limiting factor, which, you know, chances are actually might not actually be the limiting factor with college division one football, 
you need a place to run. So I would figure out a way to accommodate that solution. Then we look at it from the actual equipment, right? Like if I don't have the pieces of equipment, like whether it's open space, a track, a turf, or maybe even some sort of resisted run, some uphill runs, or working on some things that I can actually do open top end speed. Yeah, you're going to struggle to provide that person with the level of service that they need. And then the coach, right? Like the, the knowledge and the ability, right? Like coaching speed, coaching weightlifting, tricks the level of knowledge and skill that you need to know. And as we're looking through this premise, yeah, I got to do an inventory of the problems that you're reoccurring or the reoccurring. Then I look at the solutions that you're probably already gravitating to in general, and then inventorying your facility, your equipment and coach on any given day to be able to execute on that plan. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. Basically, you know, you got to start with the solution and then work backwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, same thing we've been preaching over this, this whole season. I just want to make sure we have specific examples. Like the buckets and the avatars is really helpful. Like if you have those solutions re almost ready-made, like there's going to be some small tweaks, but you have it ready-made so that you can just almost plug and play. It's going to be super helpful. Absolutely. And, and just sit there and say that you can't evolve and can't adjust and improve from over time. Uh, that's a complete lie and misconception. Hope that, is that yeah, you find more reasons to change and evolve because of that. Mm -hmm. But you have a zero focus on it. All right, let's get into the plan. So principles are true without context, right? We, we, can't, we can't have a program without principles. Principles are the foundational thing behind everything we do. Because they're true with, without any, like, situation. Hey, true in your weight room, true in my weight room, true in Asia, true in America. It doesn't really matter. They have to be there. They're the foundation of everything we do. And if they're not there... It's a pretty simple, you got to figure out a way to include that. And one area that we'll talk about will be this idea of individuality and the avatars we just talked about. Like there's got to be some sort of connection to the person and the problem they're dealing with. And we'll work through them all. But the, the reality is if you don't have principles, your program is not going to be as effective as you probably want it to be. And it's a pretty simple fix. But then we look at rules. They're true with context, meaning that they're true in your environment, but maybe not true universally. And we've seen plenty of examples of people getting away with structurally imbalanced programs to a degree. And not everyone's going to get hurt. Not everyone's going to have worse performance because of it. And sometimes when it's a very specified outcome and they're just doubling down to hopefully get the best level of output possible, that you can sacrifice a simple rule like, like structural balance. It doesn't mean you should, but it means you can. And one of the things I think is so important about rules is you have to create rules that work within your environment and they're somewhat malleable. And we go back to solution, we go back to coach, facility, equipment. We think about the rules that, you, that are starting to put in place and it might be around the bottlenecks that you know that you're gonna incur and limiting the impact of that bottleneck. So principles, loud slide here, but I'm gonna break this down into all of the principles in terms of specificity, which is related to the problem, right? We think about that problem we're trying to deal with and we're trying to create a window of training that facilitates that, right? So if I have to train to get someone faster and the problem is their flow, if I have a four-week window versus a 12-week window versus a 52-week window or four, a four-year quadrennial plan, a lot of that's going to change in the terms of the way we approach our training specifically to the individual needs. Then we look at that individual person. What is their biomechanics and physiology, right? How well do they move and how well can they actually adapt to the program that we're applying to them? And that's a specific and individual aspect of the training. Then we look at progression. You have off progression of the plan where it can work forward or backwards, right? I know where I want to be and I start to inch my way from the back to the start, or I know where I'm starting and all their limitations. Maybe that's an individual factor of looking at biomechanics, physiology, and I start to creep forward to improve their ability to adapt to whatever program that I have. And then we look at progressive overload which is the potential adaptability. We look at intensity, volume, density. All of that is the relationships between all the variables that we're trying to assign and what their potential adaptability is. And when you're thinking about applying a certain amount of volume or intensity or rest, you think about what is the potential for this person to recover from this to adapt positively in the next seven days. And if I can't, I need to adjust and toggle or titrate down. But then we look at diminishing returns, which is the, the output put measure of progressive, of progressive overload. So we look at diminishing returns as this point where what we're doing is no longer effective. And if we hit it within the prescribed sets, reps, time and attention, intensity, and rest, meaning that it is no longer what we want, and that comes in the form of either slowed bar movement, change in range of motion, altered body position, that we start to see a compromised motor pattern 
And that's a sh clear sign they didn't adapt fast enough or the adaptation demand grew too quickly. So if it's a seven day period and that's not enough, you'll see that diminishing return come out early. If it's a huge jump in intensity or volume or decreasing rest, you'll see that adaptation start to actually lack there of adaptation creep in early. And you look at those two interrelationships between progressive overload and diminishing returns, you start to evaluate that pretty quickly. And then the final aspect, going back into reversibility, it's reversibility is this idea of how long do you have to train and what is the decay effect that we need to work with? And that's relative to the person, the problem. So if I want to get a long training residual and have a long impact on my training, we need to think about what is the actual person that I'm dealing with and the specificity which we're doing that with. All right. Rules. I broke this down in the rules that I really like and the rules that I've kind of stay universal with because it just seems to be something that makes a big difference with my coaches to give some sort of clear indication of what I'm evaluating on. But we look at structural balance. If you push it, you got to pull it. We think about exercise order, higher risk, higher demand earlier, right? That's a pretty big one for me. Then we look at variety. We look at acyclical equals greater variety, meaning that they have a more diverse movement pattern or movement inventory, like an open or a a more complex or comp chaotic environment, they're gonna have to have a lot more variety with their movement selection. But those exercise rules, you're constantly going back to principles, right? If I push it, I gotta pull it, that's biomechanics. That's looking at individuals, right? If we look at exercise order, their adaptive rate or progression, we look at exercise variety. We can look at that from a specificity standpoint. You know, all that has a huge impact on that. And what I wanna do is have some sort of rule in place to hold me accountable to make sure the principles are in place. But then the same thing, we look at variables, right? We look at inverse relationships. That reps slash time of retention is inversely related to sets. So if I have more reps or time, longer time of retention, I'll have less sets and vice versa. Then we look at rep time of retention and intensity. Same thing, right? If I have more reps or longer time of retention, I'm going to have a lower corresponding intensity. The next level is going to be reps time of retention and rest. So if I have more reps and time of retention, I'm going to have less reps. Rest, I mean. So if we think about that inverse relationships and if you're trying to create a quick inventory, if you see 12, a set of 12 and you see 10 sets, you're probably not managing that relationship well. If we see maybe 90% intensity and we see potentially, I don't know, 10 reps, you're probably not managing that relationship well. And if we look at someone who's doing potentially a set of three and it's under 10 seconds of time and attention, but they're only resting 30 seconds, they're probably not going to get a lot of output out of the corresponding next sets. But then it gets into the next one, linear relationships, sets and intensity. How are those related, right? That we look at if there's more sets, there's higher intensity. And that obviously means there's less reps in there. And then if we look at the same concept with looking at sets, we can th see the same thing. If there's more sets, there's longer rest. But as you're breaking down a program, it immediately should start to have some sort of, all right, hey, this association, what's the What's the rep sets or time and retention, intensity and rest, and how are they corresponding with each other? And then we get into this back to this, this rubric here. We just move from left to right here. Sorry, it came up a little slow. Could you go into specifically, like, I want to look at those avatars again and how they apply to your solutions in terms of the lens of the, the principles and then your rules? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's go through it. Someone wants to gain weight or lose weight right? That, that idea of the individual aspect of it. They just told you their problem, right? I want to do this, right? So the individual and going back to this idea right here, there's certain exercises and there's certain variables that will be more congruent with that, right? And if I don't have the equipment or the facility or even the coach to do it, individually it becomes harder and harder to manage. But then we look at specificity, right? We know what they want to accomplish and that has a symbiotic relationship with it, but also goes into what is my training window? If it's four weeks, eight weeks, I either need to have a hyper focus on it and say, all right, like I'm just trying to create as large of a, way, a residual from a minimal amount of time or vice versa. I need to get a slow, elongated thing and help the person from a psychological aspect. And then we look to progression, right? The simple to complex, light to heavy, short to long, slow to fast, et cetera, et cetera. And if I look at it from the context of, all right, man, I'm trying to make this person as robust towards their goal as possible, then I'm going to really struggle from the context of, all right, like figuring out a way to progress this inside of a training aspect 
is foundational to be able to provide a level of training that service that you need. But then you go back to what this kind of key we're looking forward. I can work forward to backwards, right? I can go, all right, I'm going to think about their problems and I'm going to start to build a program moving forward. I can think about the other end. I know where I want to be and start to work backwards. Then the next level is progressive overload and that's adaptive rate, right? So if they can do their sets and reps and their intensity with the prescribed rest, then we know that they're adapting at the level that we want. But then we look at the next level of diminishing returns, that's their rate of adaptability. And if they're not adapting to said stress, we need to accommodate that with more rest or lowered intensity or lowered volume. And then the final aspect is that reversibility, thinking about that person who wants to gain weight or lose weight. And what is the residual from the time? Like if they're training for a bodybuilding show or a board short show or something where they're going to have to really, really present their body composition on stage, and we're going to stop training four weeks out, do we have enough training residual from what I'm doing in that first maybe four, eight, 12 weeks, man, to carry over into a show four weeks from now? And that's a big thing when we look at the, the timing of this all. And then how that impacts the rules, right? So if they don't have equal pushes and pulls, biomechanics are going to be off, right? We're going to start to see mechanical breakdown. We'll start to see compromised position technique, et cetera. Then if we look at exercise order, if we're doing complex, really hard exercises late, you start to see a drop off in intensity, especially if you're looking at weight loss. That, that doing really complicated things later when someone's tired is a bad idea. Then we look at variation, right? The, all right, this is pretty simple, right? This person just wants to lose weight. All right, let's get in a very, ve in a very vector oriented thing, whether it's horizontal or vertical, and just do work, right? Force and distance, right? That's all it is. I'm trying to do force and distance and diminish and decrease rest as much as possible to stimulate lipolysis. Simple, easy to do. I don't need a whole lot of variation versus I'm playing ultimate Frisbee, that person needs a huge, it's huge array of uh, actual movements on a field, has to have extremely, extreme diversity. And you, you're thinking about that, a surfer I work with, like, all right, I'm trying to prepare this person for the most chaotic environment, probably on, on the earth. And if that person doesn't have enough, enough actual exercise variety into their program, they're gonna struggle. And body composition is still important to that person, but the same token too is like, I got to prioritize them getting hurt more than anything else. And then we look at the variables, right? Like I want to increase my volume or time and attention. I want to decrease my rest. And I want to make sure that I'm conscious of the number of sets that I'm doing because I'm doing increased number of reps or time and attention with decreased rest. And those intersection there, but you just do that thing all the way through. And one of the things that I find between these two, as I break it down is, do I have the coaches to execute on principles? And do I have the equipment and facility to really accommodate the rules that I want to do with the principles? And it always starts with the coach. It always starts with that person that's going to have to execute the plan and push through. Because if we don't have that person, the equipment and facility probably doesn't really matter. A good coach can make up for a crappy facility and equipment. Uh, a bad coach with good equipment won't happen the same way because this is an ingrained and this becomes more flexible or malleable to the solution that we're trying to create. That's where the issue primarily comes. This is the master chef and he has crappy cooking equipment. You're still going to get a pretty decent meal. All right, let's, fi let's final us up here. So one aspect I like to do with our programming and thinking about my role is I'm a compiler. I'm converting instructions to a machine code or a lower level so that they can be read and executed by a computer, right? So thinking about it from, you know, we talked about this and how to become a strength coach, talk about our foundation courses are what we know is becoming more, less valuable every single day. And the, the writing a program with detached from the person in front of you and they're, they're all their idiosyncratic things is a flaw that AI or computer generated program cannot accommodate. And the simple conversation of like, I hate doing this exercise or, Hey, I, I know this is the best thing to do. I just really struggle to do really fast things at five o'clock in the morning because it's my only window of training. That's just never going to be there for that person. We could override it, but the truth is a compiler from a human standpoint is trying to break down all of the binary yes, no things, as well as all of the more complex human things into one program that represents that person's problem and the best solution to meet that problem based off our coaches, facilities and equipment. And if we think about our compiling ability, it's reps. It's just simply reps and it's reps with accountability. It's looking at it from, I need to appraise myself. I need to make sure that every single time I'm doing something, I have a series of checks and balances and I'm providing the highest quality service. Now, grading. One thing we're going to do with this is try to put together a rubric for you. Very simple. I like to keep it very binary. 
but just starting with a problem. And one thing I like to do with my coaches is explain to me what the problem you're trying to solve and what do you think is the best solution? And then we just keep that feedback loop going and we start to work through that. And then we start to look through the plan and principles. Like at this point with all of my coaches, if they're writing programs, I think they need to be ingrained. They have to be actually. And if we don't have that, it's just a whole lot of time waste. It's just, it's just, it's just basically spinning your wheels because if we don't have principles, your program sucks. It just does. And that's why our certain philosophies that don't have principles built in are always coming up short. They always do. They always reach some point of diminishing returns too quickly. They always get someone hurt. They always lead to some sort of outcome that's unpredictable. It's a shitty program. It's just bad. But that's where it comes into rules. Okay. Like we know we have to have principles. I know I have a certain level of, of facilities and equipment. Here's how I'm going to accommodate the principles with my rules. And if I think about the coaches I have, I think about the motivation, their ability, and their knowledge is, I like to think about the rules need to be more flexible to them based off the equipment or the actual solutions that I have. And you find this play out a lot. Hey, I got racks, I got barbells, I got dumbbells, I got kettlebells. I don't have many machines. I don't have an ability to isolate a joint. I don't have a lot of skill and maybe Olympic lifting or speed work, but I still need to make someone more athletic and more capable on a, on a football field. Or I don't have a lot of stationary cardiovascular equipment, so I still, but I still need to help someone lose weight and leveraging compound multi-joint movements to be able to do that. But then I go through the final aspect. Is there a lot of spelling and typos, right? This is, this is obviously an area that I think is the easiest and most important, but we often neglect and we often just do that because that's your representation. If there's going to be a lot of typos on the workout, probably thinking the athlete or the client is like, well, how well thought out was this? And it's a pretty simple fix. It's like your resume when you think about it. If you don't have, you can't spell everything correctly or put it in a succinct, easy to read fashion, people are probably going to check you out anyway. And then continuity. I do think it's, I do think it's important to have your brand. And I look at it from, okay, well, if you have a third-party app, pretty easy, straightforward. If you have an Excel program that changes and takes a rubric and a key to follow to go through that, I, I find that athletes will struggle and there's a lot of time waste. But that's what we're thinking about with this programming. So the step from here, Corey, what we really want to do is get it out there to the world. I want people to send me their programs and I want to get with them and I want to give them this rubric and go through with them. So the opportunity here is if you're listening to this and you want to participate in getting your program reviewed, send me your program. I would like three months, break it down at the rubric. We'll get you on a call and we'll go through that one by one and we'll put that out to the world. If you believe in what you're doing, you think your program is really good, you should have a person evaluate that. And then not only that, you should be able to celebrate that and enhance that for everyone in the world to see. So those are the next steps, Corey. What, if you're listening to this, send me an email at tim at phpodcast.com and we'll break down that program for you. Oh yeah, that was awesome, Tim. Get, awesome. Those, get those programs set. You need it. Yes, sir. And we'll have a link on that for you to send. We'll develop a landing page so you guys can put that together right there. All right, sweet. Thanks, awesome. Tim. This was great. All right, Corey.